we're going to be taking a look at this lab, DOM cross-site scripting using web messages. This is the first of several Portswigger labs on the topic of web messages. Now you may not be 100% familiar with what a web message is. We're going to be breaking it down in this lab walkthrough. The idea with a web message, it's a way of two windows communicating with each other. And it makes use of this JavaScript method that lives on the window post message. Looking at the MDN web docs, it says the window dot post message method safely enables cross origin communication between window objects. It then gives an example between a page and a pop-up that it spawned or between a page and an iframe embedded within it. So the simple explanation, it's a way of sending messages between windows. Now, the easiest way to illustrate this is actually to get a specific window to send a message to itself so you can see the functionality. So we've popped open the dev tools. We haven't fired up the lab yet. We're actually on the page before that. And of course, in the console, we have access to the window object that represents the current web page that we're on. Now in JavaScript, it's possible to add an event listener and in the case of web messages, the event we listen for is actually just called message. We then provide what's known as a callback function. So what to do when this event is received, we pass an argument E to this callback function, which represents the event. By the way, you can name this parameter anything you want to. You could name it event, for example. We'll just call it E for simplicity, make use of JavaScript arrow function. So what we have here is the function that will be called when this window receives a web message. And in this case, all we'll do is console log e dot data, which is going to be the value of the web message. So we'll press enter. Nothing will happen right now. What we've done is attached an event listener to this page. It's listening for a web message. When it receives the web message, it's going to console log out the value of the message e dot data. So we can now use the method window dot post message. That's what we've just seen on the MDN web docs. And we're simply going to provide the message. Hello world. Let's press enter. We see hello world console logged to the console. We also have a URL printed out there. That's because I already have a second event listener on this page, which is console logging out the origin of the web message more on that shortly. This is pretty much everything you need to know about how web messages work. The only difference here is that the window that's sending the web message is also the window with the event listener. Normally there would be two different windows. But aside from that, this is the fundamentals behind how web messages work. So that gives us a little bit of context in terms of what we're looking for in this lab. Let's fire up the lab. Let's look for the vulnerability with web messages. Now here is the main page of the lab. We're going to fire up Burp Suite and have a look at the page source. So here is the page source. And the first thing that grabs our attention is the fact that there is an event listener on this page written in JavaScript. We can see it here inside HTML script tags, window dot add event listener. Sounds familiar. We've just looked at the functionality of this. We see this window is listening for a web message event. It then defines a callback function, same as what we did. This is just a slightly older way of writing JavaScript. We used a more modern arrow function. We see the function is taking an argument E, which represents the event. Then notice JavaScript, which manipulates the DOM document dot get element by ID adds. So we're looking for the element with the ID adds. We're then setting the inner HTML of that element to the value of the web message E dot data. So returning to our page, note that we have object object currently reflected to the page. This is actually the location of the element with the ID adds. And we could demonstrate that by making a call to the post message method window.post message. Once again, let's just pass hello world to window.post message. And we've just seen the page source. This value is going to be passed to document.getElementById.innerHTML. It's going to change the value of object object to whatever the value of the web message received. So let's make this cool. We can see object object is now replaced by hello world. In cross site scripting terms, we basically have a sync because user supplied data is potentially being passed to this callback function. The end result is that the inner HTML 
of the element with the ID adds is being set to the value of the web message. And as you've just seen, we have some element of control over the web message. Now we don't necessarily have a vulnerability yet, just because we can send a web message to the page doesn't mean we have a problem. We're supplying input just like we'd supply input to any page, whether it's through a form or some other method. The real question is whether the page is handling the input correctly, because if so, we don't have any vulnerability. So what we want to try here is injecting HTML. So we'll use a typical cross-site scripting attack vector. We'll have image source equals one. This is a payload that's going to error out. So we'll have the on error attribute equals. And remember the objective of the lab is to call the print method. Okay, let's see how the page handles this HTML input, which is going to close a HTML tag first. We can see straight away, we get the print method called. The page is attempting to print the contents of the page. Okay, so we can say categorically that the page is not handling user input correctly. There's a couple of things that should be happening here that are not happening. The first thing is if we provide HTML input, obviously that should be HTML escaped before being flashed to the page. Because if it's not HTML escaped, we actually get functioning HTML. And you can see as a result embedded in that HTML, we have JavaScript functions like print. But that's just one of a number of different security features that could be included in the page when receiving that web message. Another security feature is to check the origin of the web message. Returning back to our first window, perhaps you remember there was a second message that was being console log to the page. And that message was the origin of the event. Just to give you an idea of how that might work, returning to the event listener we coded originally, we're console logging e.data. The method that produces the origin to be logged instead is simply console.log e.origin. The idea here is we can actually code a check regarding the origin of the web message. So we can do something like this. If e.origin does not equal exactly, and then we have some kind of safe URL here, which is our URL, then return. Now, often in JavaScript, you actually see curly braces for the then part of the if then statement, but you can see it's also possible to inline this. This basically allows us to prevent random people from sending web messages to our page. We check the origin of the web message. If that origin is not exactly what we expect, then we simply exit the method. We just return in JavaScript. Then of course, all of that document dot get element ID logic would never be executed because we've already left the function in this case. Of course, we've already seen the page logic here and there's no check regarding the event origin. It simply proceeds by manipulating the DOM, placing whichever user input is supplied as part of that element with the ID of ads. So this is where we now go to our exploit server. So the idea here is to imagine that the victim has visited an attacker controlled page and we're going to load up the vulnerable page inside an iframe. And the reason we do this is because when the victim lands on the attacker controlled domain, we have control over the iframe window. We can send web messages to it. We can call that post message method on the iframe. Whereas if we were to just get the victim to visit the regular domain itself, i.e. not in an iframe, well, it's not as if they're going to be firing up the console and posting messages to themselves. Besides, even if they were, that's now not really cross-site scripting. That's actually self XSS in this context. So for it to be an automated attack, imagine that the victim is visiting an attacker controlled domain. We're loading up the vulnerable lab, the vulnerable page within an iframe on that attacker controlled domain. And what we're given the opportunity to do here is insert the code that's going to appear on the attacker controlled domain. Now I'm going to copy the payload from the lab solution. Most important thing here is understanding the payload. So firstly, we have an iframe and within that iframe, we're going to load up the vulnerable page or lab. The only thing we need to do is change your lab ID with the ID of the lab. Obviously these labs are spun up in individual instances and they'll have a unique ID for each lab. So back to the lab itself, we can see an ID here, which is going to be unique to this lab. It needs to be part of our exploit to load the correct instance of the lab inside the iframe. 
Notice we then have an onload attribute. So once the iframe has finished loading, it's going to execute the JavaScript that's defined inside the double quotes here. This, which refers to the iframe content window that refers to the window object, then recognize our dot post message method. We're passing image source equals one on error equals print. Now notice there is a second parameter passed to post message. We actually have an asterisk inside single quotes. A little bit of fun. I'm going to remove that from the payload. Let's see if the exploit works without that. Now, one thing that's possible before attempting to solve the lab is we can view the exploit. So this simulates us being the victim visiting the attacker controlled domain. Before we do that though, let's just store the exploit. Now let's choose view exploit. So we see the attacker controlled page, we see the iframe, but we don't see our image. So the attack has failed in this case and it's because we removed that second parameter. So let's add that second parameter back in. Let's discuss what that parameter is and what it's doing. First of all, let's store the exploit. Let's click view exploit. This time we get the print window. So obviously this entire attack hinges around that second parameter that's applied to post message. So what is that second parameter? So returning to MDN web docs, we see that there are a few different arguments that can be provided to the post message method. The one we're interested in is the target origin argument. We have a description here of target origin specifies what the origin of this window must be for the event to be dispatched. And just to be very clear here, when it says this window, it's referring to the destination window, the target window. So this second argument is providing some control over where the messages are sent. Okay, let's experiment with that. Let's return to our original window that had the event listener and is console logging out both the event origin and also the event data. Window post message. And once again, we're just gonna post hello world just as a starting point. Get two pieces of data console logged out. We have the origin of the message what is the origin? In this case, it's HTTPS portswigger.net. That's the page that we're on. That's the origin. It's also the target origin, because remember, in this case, we're getting the page to send a message to itself. Then we also have the data of the message, which is hello world. Now, as we saw, a second argument can be passed to post message. And the idea is if the second argument, the target origin does not match up with the actual origin of the recipient, then the event is never dispatched. So if we tell post message that the target recipient is www.google.com, when in fact the actual recipient is portswigger.net, guess what? The event is never going to be dispatched. Press enter. Notice we get nothing console logged to the screen now because the event was never dispatched. In fact, we even get an error message failed to execute post message on DOM window, the target origin provided, google.com, does not match with the recipient window's origin, https portswigger.net. But hold on, we were actually able to post to this window without providing a target origin. If we just exclude that second argument, we don't seem to have any kind of problem whatsoever. Well, part of the reason here is that we're not posting cross origin. We're not posting from one window to another window. We're actually just posting to ourselves. This is the same origin. In our lab setup, it's actually two completely different origins. In other words, it's not going to work by default. We need that second argument in post message to say which origins are allowed for the event to even be dispatched. So if we don't provide that argument, the event will never be dispatched because it's a cross origin web message as undoubtedly most web messages will be. So that's why returning to the exploit server, it's very important that we specify the allowed target origin for this post message or the allowed recipient, if it's easier to think about it this way. Now, what do we have an asterisk? The asterisk basically is a wild card in this context. It says, we do not care about the origin of the target or the recipient, regardless of the actual origin, go ahead and post this particular event. So depending on the exact setup, not only can we code additional security here by making sure the correct target origin is set as that second argument, but as we've also seen from the event listener side of things, we can also add additional security there. We can add things like HTML escaping. We can check the origin 
of the web message to make sure it's part of an allowed list of origins. Because as you can see in this case, the developer doesn't actually have access to this argument. This is the attacker that's manipulating this particular value. So it's important to also have security on the event listener side of things because the developer actually has control over that in this case. So even if the attacker did all of this stuff, if there were proper security checks coded onto the listener side of things, then this exploit doesn't even exist. Okay, so to solve the lab, we now choose the option deliver exploit to victim. We've already seen it works, but now we actually solve the lab, we get the message, congratulations, you solved the lab. So really this was an introduction to web messages, how they work, how to mitigate security vulnerabilities involving web messages. And ultimately this was a type of cross-site scripting attack. Although it's under the DOM-based vulnerabilities on Portswigger, this particular DOM-based vulnerability results in a cross-site scripting attack because we've seen user input was passed into that callback function on the add event listener. The DOM was then manipulated in direct response to that callback method being executed. So this is actually a type of DOM-based cross-site scripting attack. All right, hope you found it interesting. Thanks very much for watching. Catch you guys in the next lab.